Hi, this is Dr. A, and I'm bringing you a video on research design. So this is going to be in this limited series on research. We're going to look at research problems, research questions, and hypotheses. Okay, so first question, how do I create a research question? Because that's the beginning of a research project. And so it is a step-by-step -step process, and it goes from the general to the specific. And I find that a lot of times students tend to get stuck on the general, um, and they find a topic that they want to do, but um, that topic is way too broad. Okay, so um, let me give you an example. So I assigned him, um, again, to do usually a literature review, and I say, okay, pick a topic, and they come back and say, I want to do type 2 diabetes. Okay, well, that's great, but it's way too broad of a, a topic. So, I mean, it's a good start. It's a starting point, but there are literally like hundreds of thousands of articles on type 2 diabetes. So what is it that you want to research about type 2 diabetes? And so... Um, one way to to like get deeper into to that is to then identify a research problem, and then within uh, the material of uh, within that topic, right? And so then from there you can start developing your research question, and then you're going to develop your research hypothesis. So we're going to dive a little deeper into each of these four steps to create a research question. Okay, so. You do start with a very general topic. So, you know, again, when students say, oh, I want to do something on type 2 diabetes or on autoimmune diseases, um, that's good, it's really general, but uh, we need to narrow it down. And so, um, if you're not sure what you're interested in, uh, then you can go look into, you know, so. You know, it starts with interest, but you're like, I don't know, nothing, I don't know, nothing's interesting, or um, I can't pin it down. So is there anything you saw that was part of your clinical experience? Even if you're a student, you, you're out in clinics and you saw a really interesting case or something like that, and it got you interested about a specific disease process or treatment or whatever. Uh, is there a particular problem or conflict in your field of study? that needs to be resolved. Maybe a conflict between two different types of treatment. Um, it, do you want to reproduce another interesting study? Do you want to validate a new instrument? So a new way to um, analyze something, a new way to treat something, a new way to, ass you know, to assess something, not treatment, that's, sorry, instrument is measurement, right? And so to measure an important variable in the field. Um, or do you want to try to repeat a study with a different design uh, methods? Um, so, you know, those are all things that um, you can do. And sometimes you can even try to repeat one of your own studies um, to, um, you know, maybe tweak it, change it up a little bit. So, um, once you've narrowed down, so again, to, to like a, a broad topic of interest, like type 2 diabetes, then... Um, you want to find what problem within that topic do you want to solve? What, where is there a problem? Where is there a hole in the literature and stuff? So uh, one of the examples I like to use is uh, like in type 2 diabetes uh, is the, the newer um, glucose, continuous glucose monitors that have been on the market. Now they're, they're more heavily used with type 1 diabetics, but could it be beneficial to type 2 diabetes? How many people with type 2 diabetes are wearing them, could it increase compliance, and so this is, again, it's a, it's a new product that's been out there, so it, it creates um, another opportunity for research. And so, um, do a literature survey of the topic. So now we've got it kind of narrowed down a little bit, but you could just do a, a survey of the, the literature, but again, with type 2 diabetes, there would be so many uh, articles that you might even want to narrow that down into or you want to look at the treatment angle the compliance the testing like what what is it lifestyle changes what do you want to look at um, for type 2 diabetes and so one way to do that is to do in a quick literature sur survey so going through the major research journals um, for you know 
example for diabetes, it, diabetes could be some nursing journals, but it could be nutrition journals. There's so many different things it could be. Um, and so you are just, you know, looking, reading the titles, uh, doing a search in PubMed, you know, pulling up your title, seeing what's there, reading the abstracts. Also, see how many hits you get on the topic. So, uh, you know, if you, you know, put a certain topic in there and you get hundreds of thousands of, or, or at least tens of thousands of articles, well, you know it's already, um, there's al already a lot that's been done. It, it could be that everybody's already kind of done everything. But if you, if you put um, certain search terms in and there's like hardly anything that comes up, then that could be an opportunity then for uh, research to, to you know, plug in a hole, basically. And so uh, reading the literature is a really big part of coming up with the research question and the problems that are out there. So um, lit re a lit review uh, does, or a review, so or just quick, even if it's a scan, if you will, of the literature, it can tell you what is already known on the topic, what kind of studies have already been um, published, what things are already kind of established, right? Uh, where are there gaps in existing knowledge? Um, are there conflicts that contradict each other? Because sometimes, you know, you find a study that says one thing and then a study says the exact opposite, you know, um, which one is right? Or which, you know, which side do we need, we need, obviously need to keep investigating if we're having, you know, if studies are, are giving conflicting um, answers on the same question. It will reveal also different study designs that are used by researchers in the field. Um, and so that can also help you if you are designing a study then later to, to pick the right design um, for your study. Uh, and it also will reveal which studies have already been replicated. So who's already, you know, um, done the study again in a, maybe a different setting or, um, you know, it's been done and redone and redone and you probably don't need to just do it also. So as you develop the research question, you want to get more specific. So again, what aspect of your research problem are you going to tackle and study? And this is where you really need to get specific. Um, so and the question needs to be answerable with a study that can be conducted. Okay? So this research question should be important. It should have an impact on current long knowledge. You should be contributing something to uh, the field. You might be testing out a new treatment, uh, a, new, a prevention strategy, a new diagnostic test. Uh, the question needs to be answerable. So for that, it needs to be specific with uh, variables that can be identified and measured precisely. Um, and so as you have to be able to, to, to measure an outcome in you know, your study populations. And um, they also do have the skills to complete this research, or the money, or the time, or the equipment. And so, um, you know, this is where sometimes you need to get funding, and sometimes lots of funding. There are some studies that can be really expensive to conduct. Um, one of the cheapest things to do is to do a literature um, survey, a, a, um, you know, meta-analysis, or systematic review of the literature, because that just requires time. Um, and uh, usually, you know, doesn't really require any kind of money on the part of the researcher. And so one of the things I like to think of when I'm thinking of a research question is kind of like a SMART goal, right? Uh, it needs to be specific. Uh, the outcomes need to be measurable. You need to be able to measure something in one population versus another or one group versus another. Attainable, you have to be able to, to conduct it, to do it in a reasonable amount of time. Right, so this time T for time base, and it needs to be relevant. And it needs to be uh, something that is again advancing science, contributing to um, you know the knowledge in your field. So as you get more specific, uh, some of the things you might want to ask is what population do you want to study? Um, age, gender, ethnicity, health status all factor into this decision. Um, Maybe there's not been a lot of research in this area with female subjects or African Americans. Um, or young people, or you know, zip codes can be a, a determinant of health. So there are so, so many things. So maybe somebody did the study in Europe, and you want to do it in the U.S. Or maybe you live in a rural area, and uh, the study was done in an urban area, and you want to see if it's you know, you, can you replicate get the same results with um, technically a different population. 
Um, you do want to be able to identify your variables and how you want to measure them. So um, the variables in your study are the characteristics that can vary from one person to the next or from one group to the next. So in our type 2 diabetes, one of the variables that's easy to measure um, that reflects change over time in compliance with treatment, for example, is A1C, hemoglobin A1C. Uh, so that would be an example of a variable that you can measure in the study. Vitamin D levels can be um, one um, because you can you know, measure them. Uh, pain levels on pain scales, depression with using a depression uh, questionnaire. And uh, the measurement methods can vary. So it can be instrumentation as you would for uh, use for A1C levels or vitamin D levels. It can be questionnaires for um, depression, for example, or food frequency questionnaires, or it can be, you know, a, a scale, a Likert scale for pain. Uh, you could um, review charts and things like that. So this is how, you know, you can um, gather some of your variables. But there still need to be things that you need, you can record somehow, assess. Um, and so there are two different ways to define your variables. There's a conceptual definition of a variable variable. So that's the dictionary definition. So like an example of uh, A1C, it would be it is a hemoglobin that sugar has attached itself to and, you know, the higher the blood glucose level, then the higher the amount of A1C there's going to be and it, you know, it reflects compliance with treatment or at least it reflects the average glucose level over a period of two to three months. So that could be the conceptual definition of A1C. The operational definition is how you define it in your specific study. So what, like, what are the cutoff points? So for an A1C, you know, do you um, consider, you know, six and below compliant, or is it six and a half, or is it seven? Like, where are your cutoffs that you're using? What's considered? What would be a, a group that's considered low? So it'd be less than. What's normal? What's high? Um, like in A1C, you're not really so concerned about low. You might be, you may just have normal and high and very high, and you, you may, um, you know, define these cutoff points differently. For vitamin D, you could have uh, a low or a deficient group, or you can even have a deficient and a very deficient, and then a normal uh, or low normal, you know, mid-range normal. There's so many ways that you can define your your different groups um, depending on like the level of uh, something. And so um, you also want to define what is the dependent and independent variables. So the independent variable is the cause. Uh, that value is independent of other vari variables in the study. And the dependent variable is the effect. It de This value depends on changes in the independent variables. So in my example of um, type 2 diabetes and continuous glucose monitoring. If you wanted to see the impact of continuous glucose monitoring, let's say on compliance with, um, you know, glucose control and stuff in type 2 diabetes, uh, the, the independent variable would be, you would have to have one group that's using a continuous glucose monitor and one group that's not, that's just doing, you know, business as usual, just regular things. And that would be your independent variable. It's what you know separates these two, and then the effect on in both groups could be the A1C. So we would get usually a baseline, and then you would get one um, after a certain amount of time um, with um, the continuous glucose monitor. But all your patients would be type two diabetic, right? And so you know that's part of selecting your subjects. Um, and so then you want to develop your hypothesis. So it's an educated guess about the outcome of your investigation. So it could be something like, again, in our example, in our scenario with type 2 diabetes and continuous glucose monitoring, uh, it could be that the continuous glucose monitoring would cause a um, better compliance from the patients because they're constantly seeing like how food impacts their glucose and the choices, how the choices that they make in real time, they can see how it's changing their sugar. And so um, then that could drive you know, better behaviors, etc. So then your, your hypothesis would be that in the group that's type 2 diabetes that has continuous glucose monitoring, you would see better compliance in a, in a um, 
more controlled A1C at the conclusion of the study versus uh, the patients that are uh, just type 2 diabetics that are doing uh, business as usual. Um, and so there are four types of hypotheses um, which one can choose from. And um, all the hypotheses will predict the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable, right? So it can be a descriptive one. So this is usually used in qualitative research, and I'll have more on, on research design in that later. Uh, but qualitative research um, seeks more to um, like ask questions that um, have like long answers. Um, I was part of uh, one qualitative research where the researcher were, was asking questions about cheating in classes in higher education, and so. Um, she wanted to know like how, as a faculty, I approached it, and so it was um, very narrative. And then she was pulling themes out of all of her interviews. So that's an example using interviews, long form interviews, as qualitative research, right? Um, uh, you can have a hypothesis validating tools of measurement or so a statistical analysis. Um, you could have a hypothesis that looks at the relationship between two variables, again, the, the dependent and independent variables, um, often used in epidemiology, so studying diseases, trying to link, um, you know, something, one variable to another. And then there's also, there are also hypotheses that um, trying to determine cause and effect as used in a randomized controlled trial. So again, uh, the hypothesis that you have, like what, how you think this is going to turn out, will guide the design, the methods, and the analysis of the study. There are really only two hypotheses, though, for each study. Uh, it's either the research hypothesis or alternative hypothesis. It states that the expected relationship between the variables um, in, in your study, so it states um, the research hypothesis, for example, in our example, would say that there is uh, a relationship between continuous glucose monitor use and control of glucose as, you know, uh, shown by A1C measurement. Uh, the null hypothesis says that there's no relationships between these variables. So the null hypothesis would say that it doesn't matter if they're uh, doing business as usual for the A1C measurement or the continuous glucose monitor there's no relationship between that and the A1C. There, there's just no, you know, one does not predict the other or does not affect the other. Um, and the research hypothesis says that it does. Um, and so it's, it's one way or the other, right? And uh, when you're trying to develop your hypothesis, you do need to do a more intensive literature survey. So this is where you're honing in more on what else has been done um, and you need to get to know the results of other studies, how they design their studies, what methods they use, what statistics they use, what conclusions did they draw of everything that's published out there on that specific topic. Um, and you always want to read the primary sources, the original study. So if you find a secondary source like a meta-analysis or a systematic review, those are not good enough because that's somebody else's perception of the studies and maybe they understood them properly and maybe they didn't. However, these can be a good source of other studies so that you can go look in all this in their, their references and all the studies that they used and, um, and pick out all the original studies and then go to the original source and read the original studies for yourself so that you can get an understanding of how that research person or team um, set up their study and what results they got, what methods to use, et cetera, and you can really um, understand it properly because, um, you know, research studies can be misinterpreted, and certainly can, uh, or things can be left out that are important. And that wraps up my first video then on research design, and I will have more to come.